profit in $33 billion just in the swine flu vaccination by itself. Bottom line is, <laughs> there's no money to be made in making people healthy. So let's move on to the main topic of the presentation tonight. And that is, really when you look at mainstream media, and that includes uh, doctors and books and health experts out there, what do, what do they attribute to the obesity? What do they attribute to the, uh, the pandemic increase of overweight people and obesity in the United States? We're leading the world in this, by the way. Well, the answers you've heard before, but I want to go over them. They attribute ba basically to poor nutrition, lack of exercise, genetics, and lack of willpower. We've all heard this before. However, this does not explain why, for example, in the 1950s and 60s, obesity was rare, almost non-existent. And today, it is out of control. So what has changed over the years in a relatively very short period of time? Nowhere in the history of humankind have we had obesity anywhere near the rate we're at right now. So what has changed in the last 50 to 60 years? Is it that the people in the 1950s and 60s and before that had more willpower? Is it that the people in the 1950s and 60s exercised a lot more than we do today? Absolutely not. Today there are more health clubs and more people paying memberships to more clubs and exercising more than ever in the history of humankind. Now did people in the 1950s... Um, did they exercise and did they have more willpower? Did the genetics suddenly change? No, of course not. Simply stated, what has changed is our food supply has changed. Today, more than any other time in, the, in history, we eat more processed foods each year. The FDA approves more and more chemicals for the use in food. Each year, the food industry is using more and more and more chemicals in the foods that they feed us at alarming rates. These chemicals are used to increase shelf life, to kill bacteria, to improve the taste, replace fats, because you know we want to have low fat foods, right? So somehow we've got to replace the, the taste in there. How do you do that? Replace carbohydrates, because a lot of people think you gotta have a low carbohydrate diet. So there's low carbohydrate meals out there. Well, they've got to make that food taste better. It's got to be palatable to the consumers, so they've got to replace it with lots of chemicals. The most important thing to the food producers out there is the chemical use increases profit. Now, the purpose of this call tonight is to raise your awareness to a much more likely cause of the epidemic in obesity and overweight in our country rather than what we've been told. Because quite frankly, poor nutrition, lack of exercise, lack of willpower, and genetics, in my strong opinion, do not explain or even come close to explaining why we have this obesity epidemic in our country. So, I'm now going to share with you the more likely cause of the weight problem in the U.S. And what I'm going to start out with tonight is talking about a topic uh, uh, that you've maybe never heard of before. It's called excitotoxins. Excitotoxins. What exactly is excitotoxins? Well, as the name suggests, it's something that excites and that is toxic. An excitotoxin that most of us have heard before, particularly in the 80s, is MSG. MSG was very popular uh, and still is today, but more so in the 80s in Chinese restaurants. And if you look at the cartoon that I've got up here, it, it's, a, it's a couple who just finished a Chinese dinner. And they're reading their fortune cookie. And the fortune cookie says, my fortune cookie says that in a few minutes I will get a headache, feel flush, and experience all the other symptoms typical of an MSG overdose. You see, why would Chinese restaurants use MSG? Which is which stands for monosodium glutamate. Well, they use it because MSG is really cheap, number one, and number two, it has an incredible ability that when you add it to food, it makes all food taste good. It's like a miracle drug. It makes all food taste really good. The second thing that it does is it makes consumers eat more 
and it makes consumers crave that food more so they'll come back and purchase it again or eat at that restaurant again. So it is a restaurant and food manufacturer's dream drug. The problem with excitotoxins like MSG is that it's one of the few substances that's able to immediately break the blood barrier to our brains. And it goes right into our brains and it excites it, hence the name Excito. It excites the brain, it stimulates the brain, and that's what gets us to crave the food more and more. But it's toxic to the brain. It kills brain cells as well. You see, food manufacturers love MSG because it makes people crave their foods more when they have to remove fats out of the food to create a product, say, that's low fat or low in carbohydrates. That's where the flavor is. So how do they replace it back? Well, one of the methods is to replace it with excitotoxins like MSG. Now, I'd like to introduce you to a wonderful book if you'd like to learn more about this. It's by Dr. Russell Baylock. Now, it's called Excitotoxins, The Taste That Kills. Now, Dr. Baylock is a board-certified neurosurgeon. He's also one of the leading experts in the world on excitotoxins. In his book, he explains how researchers who, are, who need to study obesity, um, they typically need obese rice, uh, or mice or rats. So the question is, is that if you are doing research on obesity, how do you find obese mice or rats? Well, for the past 20 years, the way that research have, has have been doing it is they simply add MSG to the mice or rats diet. They just add it to the food. And it makes, it makes them fat faster than anything else that they can do. It makes them obese faster than anything else they could do. And it's cheap and easy to do. Now here is the kicker. They're not feeding the rice, the, the mice or the rats more food. They're just adding the MSG. Now that report is an independent study <coughs> that is contained within the book, Excitotoxins, The Taste That Kills. I encourage you to go in there and take a look at it. Um, I would also encourage you to do some of your own research. And there is an hour-long presentation. It's a free video uh, given by Dr. Baylock to his colleagues on excitotoxins. It's a wonderful presentation, and I would encourage you to watch it. The URL is up on the screen, or you can just do a Google search for excitotoxins, the taste that kills, and it'll come up. It'll be well worth your time. It'll raise your awareness level. Now, just a side note, um, Dr. Baylock, the author of Excitotoxins, The Taste That Kill, he's not a pariah in his field. In fact, as he goes on to explain, and I've confirmed with other sources, is that excitotoxins right now is one of the most hottest topic and most accepted topic by, by people in the field of neurology. Okay, so my point is, is that Dr. Baylock is not somebody who is by himself talking about this stuff and other people do not believe him. He is a leader and respected in his field and his colleagues generally agree with all that he is saying about excitotoxins. So I encourage you to do your own research and educate yourself about it. Now the problem is, is that in the 1980s MSG became uh, aware to the public because of Chinese restaurants and it was found in there. So very quickly, uh, restaurants and food producers knew that if they continued to use MSG in their products and it was labeled MSG, that consumers probably wouldn't buy their products. Just like a restaurant. If a Chinese restaurant was to label, we are serving Chinese food with MSG in it, then most people probably wouldn't go there any longer. And f restaurants and food manufacturers realize that. So over the past... 20, 25 years, they've become very creative in finding other alternatives that act exactly the same as MSG. And this is a partial list of MSG aliases. Now, this is only a partial list on here. And we'll go on to the next page, which is also 